So our next speaker is uh, Taeyun Choi. Taeyun Choi is an artist and co-founder of the School uh, School for Poetic Computation here in New York. Uh, in 2018, Taeyun is working on distributed web of care and an ongoing research with a critical perspective towards technology, ethics, justice, and sensitivity to the concept of personhood. So welcome to the stage, Taeyun Choi. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, nice to see you all. Um, OK, so I'm the last. Can we all stand up if you want? And then the right hand is going to point to where you came from today. <laughs> and then the left hand is going to point to where you're going to go today after this talk. And we're going to go switch back and forth really quick. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, thanks for inviting me to speak today. The School for Poetic Computation is a very small school based in the West Village of New York City. And the motto of the school is more poetry, less demo. And we offer a few varieties of classes that are either intensive, like 10 weeks intensive, we meet every day or part-time classes and public events. And I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, one of my projects and how that leads into the school and how the school has inspired me to do some other things. This is a diagram of 8-bit RAM um, made out of these logic gates, which are the fundamental building blocks of electronic computer. And you can see that different parts of the logic gates are connected via a line that are the path for data. And it's almost like this very complex and ornate city where different parts of the cities are communicating with each other. And when I connect them together, it becomes an electrical circuit. In this case, it's an 8-bit shift register. It means that when I enter the data into the red button, it keeps track of that memory for eight clock cycles. And you can see that data traveled from one end to the other. And it's very interesting to think about how this relates to other types of computation or electronics. So if you think about synthesizers that are dividing octaves, this is what it's doing. If you're thinking about calculators multiplying, that's what it's doing at the core of the computation. And I started making computers with these low-level electronics. And I got a little bit ambitious and started making more complex machines. This one has. Uh, a bit more RAM, and then it has 10 cycles, and it can keep track of the information over time. I made a series of these objects that are called handmade computers, and it's installed as a almost programmable computer. I say almost because without the human operator, which is me, it is not able to program automatically. And it is possible to make a fully programmable machines from electrical parts. But I lost interest about engineering part of, um, at this point because I just realized th there's a beauty in recreating the past, but I think the more urgent thing is to think about how the past has influenced the present and how the present is leading to the future. So I started writing about that process. So in a comic book that was published at avant.org, um, I worked with Sam Hart, an editor, to think about telling the story through graphic novel form. So we can think about the minimalist artwork, like a blue painting. And when we enter the painting, we see the textures and these shapes and how the spaces inside of the painting are divided. And I make connections between artwork, industrial concepts, and technical knowledges through the writing and references. The school 
has been around for five years already. Um, these are the pictures from the very recent graduates of the 10 weeks program. I'm just happy thinking about them because it's been a really rewarding journey to be part of this growing community. Uh, we have students coming from engineering, art, and design, some from journalism and literature, and they join us for 10 weeks um, full time, and they come from different parts of the world. And I think the most interesting and inspiring part about being in this community has been how generous people have been by sharing their knowledge and sharing their energy and mentoring each other. So when students ask or in, uh, they want, when they apply to be part of the program, the first thing that we ask is, what can you teach when you come to become a student? So it's no longer a binary division between teacher and a student, but it's an interdependent relationship. And they, went, they go on to create their own schools, they create companies, they make artist collectives. And yeah, that's been the most rewarding part. These are the photos of some of the faculties, actually all the faculties from the fall session. And we have artists, coders, critical theory folks, um, designers, and dancers. Quite a good mix. And I think it's also important to say that we have a group of teaching assistants who assist teachers and also the help students with technical and conceptual to, um, help because we have 18 students and we have six teachers. But even at that ratio, it's really hard to keep track of everyone's projects and support them in the right way. So we have one teaching assistant for each track. Every Wednesday, we have family dinner where students cook together, they often have these instructions that are inspired by computation, and they invite guests, and we have a huge um, dinner party in front of our space. And our space is located in West Bath, which is a historic nonprofit arts organization that provides residence for artists, and we're at the storefront. And it used to be home of Bell Telephone Lab, which is an um, instrumental institution in thinking in inventing the telecommunication protocols and hardware that we use today. A couple of people work there, including Shannon, uh, Claire Shannon, and he's oftentimes noted as the father of the information age, if you, if you can forgive this patriarchal references for a minute. And what he did, which is in instrumental, is that he understood that the binary numbers could also be replicated in electrical circuit. So by using electricity other than mechanical forms, you could create a binary numbers that, are, um, that could transform into other types of numbers. Klaus Shannon was working for the US Secret Service and um, government operations inside of the Bell Labs and outside, while Alan Turing, the computer scientist who's known, known for the Turing completeness and uh, other types of computing concepts, were working, was working for the British uh, Secret Service at the time. I think they met once in the Bell Labs, and they actually could not talk about their technical research because you know it was a government secret. But they asked these questions: Can machines play chess? And can machines think? And that's a two different questions that are still very relevant to today when we think about machine learning, artificial intelligence. I think it's important to note that Shannon had a very long life. He was respected and had an um, impact in academic um, structures of computer science and industry, whereas Turing's life was cut short in 1954. And you might know that it was because he was gay. There's no other reason why he had to, his life had to be cut short. And it makes me think, what if Turing was alive today? Or what if he had a full life? What kind of computing would we be using? And what kind of culture of technology would we be part of? So it's important for us to think about the people who are normally marginalized from technology or industry to be the center of our curriculum and our community. The building was also home for artists like Mars Cunningham, John Cage, and Carolyn Brown practicing at the top floor of the building. And Shockley and his team, uh, which are noted for inventing transistors from the Bell Labs, were also had an office in that same building. So this uh, 
parallel between artistic and avant-garde rigor and technical rigor is also important for us. So we don't say, we never say coding is easy. Like we never say we make it easy. We say it's really, really hard. And we don't romanticize any of this. Like it takes, like 10 weeks is not enough. It might take a few years. And I mean, I've been in this field for 10, you know, 15 years and I, I am still learning all the time. Like there's no way of saying like, you can finish, you can be a coder in like 10 weeks. Like I don't believe that. So instead what we do is we create a culture of care and a nurture, nurturing environment in which we could prototype and fail and collaborate. The outcomes are quite interesting. Um, this is some of the project from this fall by Lin Yun. This piece displays the word communication in a typographical form, um, but it's also interactive and kinetic. So it takes a little bit of time to get used to what it's showing, but it, it asks for that engagement. This project is an existential computer, so it has no function but to question the existence of itself. So the computer digs through the Wikipedia and reads aloud the, the philosophy of, of existence, and it's amplified in the toilets of our school. This piece is a help desk for tech workers, having a lot of our students come, to, come from the Silicon Valley and you know, big corporates. And you know, it's, it's not easy being an engineer. And there's a lot of this ethical questions about like, what are we creating? Like, what kind of waste are we making? And why are we spying on people? And this person wants to be a therapist, a professional clinical uh, social worker. And he created a piece where the audience could submit their issues and then the, the machine becomes a, kind of a, a repository of issues that people are having. Some other works are a bit more formal in which this is a refraction, reflections of the light um, that over generated forms. And this piece is a dialogue between a machine and a human. So the AI um, software on the computer tries to draw the portrait of the audience while the human artist, who's the same artist who programmed the machine, is trying to create a caricature of the audience at the same time. The machine is more prolific, but artist's version is actually more engaging. Some of these are about um, aesthetics, and I think the poetics and aesthetics are really important. People often ask, why do we call ourselves School for Poetic Computation? And there's a two answers. The first is that there's a poetics of the code itself. If you look at a beautifully written code, there's a poetic structures in which syntaxes and different segments and different um, structures and very subtle delicacies of languages and mathematics that connect, that are just beautiful. And it looks like a poetic form. The second part is that it's also about poetic effects that are created with code. So poetic effects are not giving answers, it's about asking questions, and it's about engaging people in a more effective way, such as this piece where the software detects um, the audience and then draws a portrait out of one line. So that's our general uh, program. And I also run um, kind of public events in collaboration with other um, collaborators such as the New York Tech Scene Fair that happened last weekend, where we tried to bring together um, comic book writers, zine makers who are working on intersection of design, storytelling, and technology. This is Mimi and Rithu, who are the co-organizers of the event. And I don't know if anyone was there, but it was really packed. We had about 700 people come through uh, through the day, and we had about 60 um, vendors. And it was just great. It was just brought people together. And a lot of these zines are critical about tech industry. It's like asking, like, do I really need to put my photos on Google? Or like, what, what is the you know, implications of all this you know, technology in our daily lives? And I'm organizing an event um, with Nabil Hussain and Sonia Baller in December 15th. This is a free event for all of you if you're interested. It's called Code Ecologies because we're looking at the intersection of uh, natural environment and computer programming and how that's affected, how that's affecting the environment, such as a you know blockchain or other kinds of software use a lot of resources. Like I am 
genuinely like against cloud computing because like there's no such thing as a cloud computing. It's all massive like data centers somewhere burning heat and like just taking up spaces. There's no such thing as cloud. It's all hardware at some point, and hardware is waste. And we have to be responsible for all of this the waste that we create. So these conversations with uh, my co-organizers um, inspired me to run this event. And um, I hope to see you there. We have environmental activists, um, scientists, and artists coming, filmmakers and artists coming in um, to speak about this event. But to fold this research and activism and education into one, I just want to show you two examples of historical documents that I think shows different types of worldview about computation, pedagogy, and design. What, on the one hand, there's like Buckminster Fuller, like, who is very well known for geodesic domes and other types of very reason, reasonable and logical structures in which that it scales. And you can see this. Um, students that are hanging from the Black Mountain College in 1949. And there's another type of structure which are elastic, which are more, it gives and receives form in a very um, plastic manner. And this is Ligia Clark's uh, net in which the audience are invited to participate and create different kinds of net and connect with each other. So let's just compare the two for a second. And on the one hand, we think about the world as these modular units, where the efficiencies and the, um, the scale is seen as the ultimate goal. On the other hand, there's much more caring and much more nuanced ways of communicating. And the responsibilities that come with being in control. So I give a lot of talks, and oftentimes in tech conferences or academia. And I just realized that I met a remarkably intelligent and very sweet person who was a student at a very um, privileged university. And they, you know, they did everything right. They had studied computer science and they had like creative arts as a you know, minor. And they work for a company named Palantir now, which is a very problematic company when it comes to idea of privacy and surveillance today. And they didn't really have this ethical coordinates to think about the impact of their work. And I just meet a lot of engineers who are just not questioning like the impact and responsibilities of their work. And as an educator and as an artist, I just don't know what we're doing if we're not giving them the, uh, the responsibilities and also space to think about that. So we have something like this where John Wayne's, um, the movie The Cowboys in 1972, which is a very typical cowboy movie, there's this noticeable absence of people of color or the ind indigenous people in this film. It's all just white people like roaming around in horses. This is just like what the tech companies want to present, the CEOs and CTOs like giving these pitches and telling us to buy some new stuff. And this idea of uh, pioneerism and frontierism, uh, frontierism has always been colonial. It's about exploring, exploring and exploiting the unknown territories. But what about the people who actually built the infrastructure? What about their lives and the conditions in which that makes possible all these conveniences of modern day technology? So let's learn from the feminists. So Joe Freeman, who I believe is credited as the, um, one of the founding uh, first generation feminists. I might be wrong. Let's just do the research in a bit. I think first or second. But Joe Freeman says, in the tyranny of structurelessness, contrary to what we would like to believe, there's no such thing as a structureless group. We can rephrase that to say there's no such thing as a powerless group. There's no such thing as a biasless decision. We are all complicit to certain types of power. Instead of that, Joe Freeman suggests distribution of authority among as many people as is reasonably possible. This prevents monopoly of power and requires those in position of authority to consult with many others in the process of exercising it. In a simple word, I think I could interpret this as like, ask for permission before you do stuff. 
or ask for consent, like ask before you deploy. And it became clear to me that the code of conduct and code of ethics and terms of services are as important as the code itself. Like we never actually read those things when we purchase things or sign up to things, right? But we should, because that shapes our uh, reality and the impact that we make as a humanity. So recently I've been thinking a lot about differences and similarities between decentralization and distribution. And this is in reaction to a lot of things that happened like over the two years with you know, the presidential election in the US and how the social media has been such a dominant force in our reality. And this incredible centralization of all of our data over things like Google Drive and Dropbox and for so forth. So can we distribute our data and software and can we distribute our decision making? Yes, we can. There's many different ways of doing it. Um, one of which is creating peer-to-peer -peer network, it's, which is something that Mindy in the first talk has mentioned. And using certain protocols like DAT, it's pronounced that, that protocol or that project, you could create nodes between two computers bypassing the centralized control. So it's still going through the fiber optics, but you know there's, n there's no interference as far as um, your share you're share, you sharing the data and you owning the data with the people that you give consent to. So in this project, I created an archive of SFPC, the school, and then sent it off to Turkey, where there was a, a design biennial. So the audience in the biennial were able to access my archive, but nobody else. So I, was safe, I felt safe to sharing my data, including some sensitive data over my, with my art audience, but not with commercial platforms. I've also expanded this project into more of a social gathering. So at the Ace Hotel New York in July, uh, we had this uh, party of distributed web of care where we tried to create different kinds of internet in real life with DJs and other props. And the code of conduct, which I borrowed from the feminist code of conduct of the internet, internet uh, were written up in the wall. So it was, very, um, it was part of the texture of the space. In the Decentralized Web Summit, which was uh, organized by uh, Internet Archive and um, where Mindy and Sam Hart were the co-organizers, I had this opportunity of like opening the whole summit, which was, I don't know, like 700 people, like 300 people, like a lot of people. But th th these were like people who are in the blockchain world or like kind of web world. And I had this chance of like trying to get them to reimagine what the network would be if they were to build it from scratch again and what kind of accountabilities that they had to ask of each other. Because what happened was that if I told them that if you're touching the string, which is a network, you have to close your eyes and you have to be constantly moving in that space. So there's a, there's a bit of a comfort, that comfort level that you need to get used to. In this kind of performances, I ask, how can we become support structures for each other? How can we trust others who have nothing in common? How can we build solidarity, not profit? And I had the pleasure of dancing with people like Vin Cerf, who's a historic, historical engineer known, um, primarily known to create TCP IP, which is a fundamental building block of the internet. And people like that are seriously concerned about the state of technology and internet today. They never really thought it would be so centralized or so commercial. So I think we're at the right time to rethink what coding and computation and internet as the largest computer that were ever built means for us. And to be sure that it's inclusive and diverse and it's, that it's a welcoming space for others. What am I doing on time? Should I wrap up? A few more minutes? Okay, cool. So that's my like story. I, I think coding education is important, but I think the other side of coding education is also important. I think the School for Poetic Computation will never replace traditional academia or uh, engineering schools. That's not our goal. We want to be on the, we want to be in we want to share some of the common spaces 
and we want to be open for people who might not see themselves as engineers to come in and be amongst artists because I think we can mutually benefit each other through conversations and there are many like in-between states that just cannot be coded or computed so I've been painting a lot recently these are some some photos from my studio I think the concepts of nature and ecology and privacy in public spaces and intimacy and tactility come into these paintings as well. And to summarize, I hope we create non-binary futures where this static notion of identity no longer makes sense, where it's more fluid. Because if you think about computers, it's all these things, which is binary, which is zeros and one, ones, and digital, which is on and off, and dialectical, which is the fundamental, uh, you know, this environment for Western philosophy is either, either true or false. These are all computable states. And if you think in this way, you can only make computable future. But let's think about this dark spaces, but darkness in a way that is not about oppressed, depressed, or kind of sad space, but darkness of the forest, like this unimaginable darkness where like you just can't grasp how powerful it is. These are just like, these are the opposite of a glossy, future of like the tech imagination, but this is like the darkness of the dark matter or the unknowable, undefinable futures. And I guess I'm just tired of speculations and this notion of a projection of the future. And I'm really interested in recreating the past to define the uh, present in order to move forward. And this starts by creating this non-binary coordinates. So if you think about X, Y, Z axis or the Cartesian coordinates, that's pretty static. But if we can think about these different knots of encounters and commoning of being in common senses and common uh, time with others, I think that could be the non-binary future that we could create. Thank you.